in 1965, the Indiana Police Department received a call, which was going to mark the history of this country because of the incredible nature of this event, of this crime that would soon be discovered. On the other end of the phone was Richard Hobbs. His voice was of a young boy of no more than 15 years old. In the call, authorities were informed that there was a lifeless girl at 3850 East New York Street in Indianapolis. The house belonged to the Vanasuski family, and the deceased person was Sylvia Likens. Who was this family and who was this woman? The Vanasuski consisted of Gertrude, the mother, and her seven children, Paula, 18 Stephanie, 15 John Jr., 12 Mary, 11 Shirley, 10 James, 8 and a baby, Dennis Jr. Gertrude had conceived the first six with her ex-husband, John Benesuski, a local aspiring police officer and a hitter who abandoned them after 10 years of being together. She later started a relationship with a 22-year-old named Dennis D. Wright would come and go from their lives, only returning to take the money that the mother occasionally earned doing some domestic work in other people's homes. And it was with him that she had her seventh child. The boy eventually also ended up abandoning them. The 36-year-old woman fell into a deep state of depression due to her marital failures, ultimately causing her to have a sudden miscarriage. On the other hand, the Likens family was a bit less problematic. It was composed of Lester Likens and Betty Francis and their five children. The two oldest were Daniel and Diana. Sylvia was the middle child, followed by two of the same age, Benny and Jenny. The latter and the protagonist of the story had become very close as she had suffered from polio and used a metal device on her legs to be able to walk, which made her introverted and dependent especially on her older sister, our protagonist as they protected each other at all times. The Lycans were dedicated to running a traveling amusement park, which made them nomads, this being a lifestyle not very favorable for growing children. So the parents chose to leave their children in the care of different relatives and friends so they could grow up in a fixed place. Both families attended the same church, so Sylvia and Jenny struck up a friendship with Gertrude's older daughters. And that's how she found out they were looking for a temporary home for the teenagers. So she offered to provide them with a roof over their heads in exchange for $20 a week. Such an amount of money was huge for someone who didn't have a steady job. And what he earned was too little to support a family as large as the Benesuskis. So it would be a win for both sides. In this way, in July of 1965, the girls arrived at Gertrude's house with no one imagining or suspecting the horror that was about to be lived. The first few weeks, everything seemed quite normal. The girls had become even closer and seemed to be living the dream of any teenage girl, living together with their best friends. They went to the same school, went out for walks together all the time. They even shared a room. However, from one moment to another, things changed. Several situations accumulated, which caused the situation to explode. Everything started with a love mess that Paula, the eldest daughter, suffered. Sylvia was blamed for it. With her lovely character, she started to create and awaken feelings in her peers. It should be clarified that the teenager was not romantically interested in anyone. She even rejected Richard Hobbs, a family friend who had declared his love for her. All this added to a delay in the Lycans family's weekly checks. Gertrude, being a bomb of feelings and vulnerability, believed everything her daughter Paula had told her about her guest, including that she had said she was a nobody. The lady then decided to punish the sisters because of her daughter's gossip and the delay in payment, yelling at them that they had taken care of them for a week for nothing and insulting them. What the mother did was gather all her children in front of the couch and ordered the girls to bend over it and proceeded to fill them with strong belt blows in front of the eyes of all the little ones and then forced them to take off their underwear, hit them with a shovel and Sylvia, thinking about her sister's situation, implored that only she be hurt. This was only the mild beginning of an ordeal that the teenager would suffer. The punishments were increasing in pain. There was even an occasion where they were beaten for eating too much at the party organized by the neighborhood church. And if it wasn't that, it was just because a boy looked at her or offered to give her a car ride. 
Any slight provocation or wrong move from the victim was a perfect excuse to receive aggressions, but she chose to face that so they wouldn't hurt her little Jenny. The victim then found a summer job, I mean Sylvia, at a grocery store, and her shift was almost all day. Gertrude started asking her all about her said job and the girl responded that she was selling empty glass soda bottles. Her answer did not convince the mother enough. According to Mrs. Benesusky's words, the girl was promiscuous and dirty, and she started spreading the rumor around the entire neighborhood that the young woman was a girl of the night. Once again, Gertrude's madness led her to unjustifiably punish the young woman. On this occasion, she forced her to undress in front of all her children and Jenny, and when she was completely exposed, she took a large glass soda bottle and she herself inserted the object into her private parts. Ignoring the complaints of the sisters, only focusing on continuing to hurt and on her little ones enjoying seeing this situation. Eventually, due to the aggressiveness of the situation described, the bottle broke inside Sylvia and the glass began to hurt her inside even more. The children's reactions to seeing that the object had broken was of excitement and they began to celebrate and cheer their joke. This form of suffering would be repeated several more times, which caused the teenager to acquire incontinence, causing even more anger from the lady. One of the most shocking things about this case is that Gertrude encouraged her children to follow her example and exercise all kinds of violence left and right against the tenant. The last time the perpetrator introduced a glass bottle to the young woman, after this suffering, she ordered Coy Hobart, Stephanie's boyfriend, who had also been witnessing and participating in all the violence towards the poor girl, to take her to the basement by any means and lock her up there. He proceeded to drag her mercilessly and obeyed the orders. At this point, in addition to encouraging her children to hurt Sylvia, she was now also doing it with her children's friends. Although at first, they only limited themselves to watching and feeding their morbid curiosity, they soon began to participate in Gertrude's atrocities, as they were encouraged by being told that it was okay, and that if their mom did it and allowed it, it was because there was nothing wrong with it. The punishments consisted, let me tell you, in blows, kicks, cigarette burns, jets of cold water all while the poor woman was tied with a rope to a post in the basement and agonized from the lack of food, which was another thing they made her suffer with. Among the people who participated most in these aberrant events were the previously mentioned Coy Hobart and Richard Hobbs. The first one practiced judo regularly, so he was encouraged to practice all the blows he had with Sylvia's weak body. Hobbs, on the other hand, took advantage of the family activity to get back at the rejection he had previously suffered from the young woman. The abuse at that moment was, as you can imagine, extreme, inconceivable. All her skin flayed, her private parts destroyed. The perpetrators had already dehumanized her due to the constant suffering they caused the young woman. In this way, Gertrude found a method to prevent people from getting tired of making her suffer. She would claim that she was constantly insulted, referring to Sylvia, that she spoke ill of them when they left the basement, and that she felt superior to everyone else in that house. Clearly, this fostered collective anger, and the abuses continued to increase. One of the sons who participated most in these events was John Jr. It could be said that he is the main accomplice of the crime, so much so that he has been recorded as the youngest convict in the state. For example, more than once, these two would gather all the baby's diapers from the family and forcibly stuff them into Sylvia's mouth. The boy also took advantage of the malnutrition and thirst that the teenager was experiencing to come down with a plate full of food, glasses of water, and tempt her by wetting his fingers with the food and water, bringing them close to her mouth and when she was about to lick them, quickly removing them from her reach. This was one of the ways in which the little one had fun when he wasn't planning new methods of causing suffering along with his mom. On her part, Mrs. Benesuski knew how to get even more out of her atrocities. She started charging five cents to anyone who wanted to go into the basement to spend some time with the young girl and do whatever they wanted to her. At this point, it probably seems incredible that no one noticed or heard anything strange, but that's not the case. 
There were actually three occasions where the abusive cult of this woman, this girl, was almost discovered. The first was when the girl's parents, Lester and Betty, came to visit them. The visit occurred without any major presence. Even the girls hid their bruises and marks for fear of the repercussions they might suffer in the future, if they dared to mention anything related. Jenny, although she always wanted to speak, was equally consumed by Gertrude's fear. He threatened her that she would receive the same punishments as her sister, if she dared to speak. The second occasion was when the Arsenal Technical Institute, the school all the children attended, received a call from a parent of a classmate of the sisters, a man named Michael John Moore, informing them that Sylvia constantly had open wounds of all kinds all over her body. They took action and sent a nurse to the Benesuski residence. When she arrived at the house, Gertrude began to claim that the young girl had run away and she revived the rumor that she was a promiscuous girl and was out of control. Regarding the wounds, she commented that it was the victim's own decision since she did not have good hygiene. And the third occasion was when the girls were able to see their older sister, and they told her from beginning to end everything that was happening to them inside that house of horror. However, she did not believe them at all, and completely ignored all that information. On the other hand, the neighbors also decided to ignore all the activity they saw or heard coming from this house because they had swallowed all the gossip that Gertrude had spread about Sylvia being a bad influence on her children and that she was dedicated to emotionally destroying anyone who approached her. Eventually, people confessed that they knew something strange was going on, but chose not to get involved in those matters and not to take risks with both Sylvia and Gertrude. One of the last and worst things the mother did to the girl was to once again order her to undress in front of all the public that they constantly had inside the house, and she decided to grab a burning knife, and began to tattoo on her torso the phrase, I'm a prostitute, and I am proud of it, letter by letter, while John Jr. held her arms forcing her to stay still. The excuse she gave for this was that the young girl had just come from an intimacy party, and that was very frowned upon. Finishing the marking, he started yelling at the teenager, Sylvia, what are you going to do? Now you won't be able to get married. What are you going to do? After finishing this, they dragged her back to the basement, and she confessed to Jenny that she felt she was close to losing her life. The next day, the matriarch devised a plan to dispose of the dying body of the incline and get away with all crime. This consisted of forcing the girl to write a letter telling her parents that she would leave that house with a boy who intended to have her as a worker of the gallant life. Then she would ask her son, John Jr., to take her to the forest and abandon her there so that she would lose her life due to starvation. The victim then managed to hear this and tried to escape as best she could. However, she was discovered by Coy Hubbard and Gertrude, so they proceeded to force her into a tub with boiling water. And when she finally fainted, they began to bash her head over and over again against the floor to try to wake her up. Although there is another version where they say that the boy hit her with a metal bar. Obviously, whatever happened, this was the worst thing they could have done to try to revive her because in the end, they ended up taking her life. Sylvia remained unconscious and in a moment of desperation, the mother tried to calm everyone down by saying that the young woman was just pretending. After some time had passed, it was Hobbes who sensed that his impossible love would not wake up, and decided to make the call that I told you about in the beginning. Meanwhile, as the police were on their way to the house, Gertrude and the accomplices were agreeing on what to say in an attempt to get away with it. However, when they arrived, Jenny took advantage of the situation to ally herself with the police telling them that if they got her out of there, she would tell them everything that had happened from the beginning. During the initial confession, the mother stated that she had done everything to protect her children from the bad influence of the sisters, but in the final trial, she completely blamed the children, arguing that she had no idea what was happening inside her house. Evidently and fortunately, the authorities didn't believe her much especially when the miners told everything that was happening and what they were doing inside their home. Richard Hobbs' confession was also crucial to clarify things and determine the consequences. Okay. 
Finally, Mrs. Benesuski and her eldest daughter, Paula, were sentenced to life imprisonment. Horvath and Hobbs got 20 years each. However, the latter died of cancer at the age of 21. John Jr. was sentenced to a 10-year prison term. The daughter, Stephanie, managed to get out shortly after as she testified against her own family. Gertrude was given parole for good behavior in 85 and died five years later. She continued to deny all the time that she was guilty of that event and argued that she didn't remember anything from that time as she was under the effect of an asthma medication. Several years later, the case resounded strongly throughout the country as Paula, after being released from prison, changed her name, had a daughter and named her after her deceased mother, and tried to rebuild a life by starting to work as a teacher's assistant. However, she was recognized and forced to resign from that job and leave that place and be the focus of attention again, taking away the peace she thought she would finally have. The events that happened around Sylvia Likens have been an inspiration. The events that have occurred, the events that happened around Sylvia Likens were inspiration for three books and two movies, The Girl Next Door and American Crime, as well as a monument inaugurated at the Indianapolis police station, which recalls the horror that someone can live in silence. If you liked this video, don't forget to follow me on my social networks, and remember that you can find me on my second channel which is Pepe Mr. Choice, where I upload slightly shorter and more updated videos.